Woods Runner, chapter 16. There was a long shallow hill as they came into what Samuel would have called a city. And Abner stopped the mules at the top of it, still half a mile out, and studied it. Samuel had never even imagined such a place. Houses and other buildings everywhere built on the land next to the open water. And that water was another thing he'd never seen. Is that it? He asked. That water, is that part of the ocean? That's the Hudson River, Abner sighed. As they'd moved from settlement to settlement, each one bigger than the last, Samuel and Annie had been asking, is this New York? And that's not New York either, Abner said. Not yet, we're in New Jersey. Look there, across the river, through the fog. That's New York. We'll leave the wagon here and the mules and get a boat across. I know somebody who might help us. Down below on mud flats that led out the, to the river, Samuel saw dozens of boats pulled up to the shoreline, some large, some small, and men waiting to row them across the river. Now and then through the mist, he could make out what seemed to be a large city, large, huge. Wait here, Abner said. I'm going to go look for a friend. Between the wagon and the river were many buildings, some with fenced in pens full of oxen and horses and mules. Abner came back. Very well. With him was a man who looked a lot like him. Gray hair everywhere, tobacco spit down his chin, old clothes. Matthew here is going to take us across and bring us back. We have had enterprise with each other before and he understands the nature of our business. I told him we hope it won't take long and that we prefer coming back in the dark if possible and fast. We'll leave the wagon of mules and dog with his boys on this side. They'll keep them ready for us. Samuel, you may take your knife, but leave your rifle here. There are soldiers everywhere and a rifle will draw attention. Annie, you wait here with the wagon. No, yes, he is all I've got. He's all I've got, and he will be back. If this works right, there will be two more people coming back with us, and the boat is not that big. We might need the room. She looked at Samuel. You come back. I will. I'm telling you. You better or else. Samuel could see that she was crying, and he found himself choking up a bit, choking up, but hit it. Don't worry, he put his hand on her shoulder. The truth was he had no idea about anything. They didn't even know for certain if his parents were over there. He looked across the river. It was late afternoon. The sun was burning the fog off. The city was huge with buildings standing three and four stories high. Houses were spread out in a grid. How could they hope to find anybody in all those buildings? Looking at the city, imagining how many people must be there made the rest of the trip seem almost easy. The woods, the forest was nothing compared to this. Away, Matthew croaked. We must go. Darkness comes fast on the river and we must be across there when there is still light for us to see. Follow. Abner moved with him toward the boat, the boats and after a moment's hesitation, Samuel followed. There were about a hundred boats pulled up along the mud bank in a long line tied to brush or small trees. Most of them looked to be on their last legs. Water soaked unpainted clunkers covered with mud and filth and came down the river. That came down the river. Samuel was surprised considering that Matthew looked even rougher than Abner to find that he brought them to a beautifully maintained painted double-ended boat about 20 feet long. There was a small cabin in the center and a short mast up over the cabin. The cabin itself could only take two people. Matthew said, get inside. What isn't seen isn't noted. He grunted as he heaved the boat out of the mud and into the slow current. Then he jumped in, 
hold the sail up, the canvas surprisingly clean and well tended, and stood to the tiller. There were no seats or benches except in the cabin, but a wooden bailing bucket was in the stern. As soon as the boat was moving in a soft breeze, Matthew pulled the bucket over and sat, put a chew of tobacco in the corner of his cheek, smiled through discolored teeth at Samuel and said, your ma and pa know you're coming to get him. Samuel looked sharply at Abner. He must have told Matthew the whole story. Abner smiled. We have done a might of business together. I told him what we we're doing. You can trust him with your life which he snorted, is exactly what you're doing. Abner as a whole network. Abner has a whole network, Samuel thought, to work against the British. People on farms, pigeons, and now the man with this boat. Abner was the most amazing man Samuel had ever met. No, Samuel, they probably think I'm dead, killed by Indians. Matthew nodded. A fair surprise for them then. It's good to have surprises for your family. And he, tended, and he tended to sailing the boat and didn't say any, another word all the way across the river. It was just as well because with a lack of anything productive to think about, Samuel didn't know where they were going, wasn't sure what he would find and didn't know what he would do when he found or didn't find his parents. His mind was taken up by the sailing. The boat must have been fairly heavy, yet it skimmed along over the water like a leaf. It wasn't so terribly fast, maybe three or four miles an hour, but it seemed graceful in some way. No, that wasn't it. Free. The wind moved them along quietly and nobody worked to make it so. It just happened. The boat nudged into the bank, out, Matthew said, and up the bank. The road into town is on the left, Sugar Mill down to the right, a quarter mile. I'll come back every night at midnight and wait until three in the morning for four nights. If you're not here by then, I'll figure the worst. What do you want done with the girl if you get scragged? Can you take her? Abner paused. Into your family? Matthew hesitated. Well, he said, Emily always wanted a daughter. So be it. But we'll bet against it. And he pushed the boat back out into the current and was gone. Abner said, let's go get it. And he moved up the bank with Samuel following. At the top, Samuel stopped dead. There were people everywhere. All along the road into the city and down the side road that led to the sugar mill, maybe hundreds of them. And it seemed that almost every man was wearing a red coat. Soldiers were everywhere. You looked and armed, walking next to the buildings, roughly forcing civilians to move out into the street. Let's start down toward the mill, Abner said. There might be somebody we can talk to, get a mite of information. They hadn't gone 20 yards when two soldiers, rifles fixed and bayonets stopped them. State your business, one said. I'm on the Crown's business, Abner answered, from across the river looking to bring food to the prisoners. I was told they're in an old sugar mill. Is that so? The soldiers laughed. Aye, said one. There and in warehouses and churches, but don't waste food on the rebels. You might as well feed it to hogs for all the good it will do. They're all marked for the box. They went off laughing and Abner started walking again, heading for the sugar mill. Samuel following had the soldier meant by marked for the box. He was so engrossed in his thoughts and in keeping up with Abner, who could walk surprisingly fast, that he almost ran full on into his mother, his mother right in front of him. It was a thing that could not happen, impossible. For the first moment, neither of them could believe it. She was dumping out a bucket of slops in the gutter as he was dashing down the street after Abner. She glanced up at him and then back at the pail, just as she dodged out of her way, hurrying to keep up with Abner. In the instant, though, their heads jerked back to face each other, and they stood stunned. The world around them stopped. 
Samuel, she dropped the bucket to the ground, reaching out her hand, cracked and red and worn to gently touch his cheek. Are you? We thought you were after the attack. Is it, is it really you? Samuel couldn't breathe, couldn't speak. I, we, and then they were holding each other, both crying until Abner said, leave off, damn it, leave off. People are watching, back away. They moved away from each other. She was very thin and drawn and looked so small, Samuel thought. Father, is he? Down the road in the big buildings, an old sugar mill full of men prisoners. I work in this house, she pointed, cleaning. I get a corner to sleep in and leftover and scrap food, which I take to your father each night. I'm a prisoner too, but this family treats me fairly. She stopped. What happened to your head? It's nothing. It's scarred. Tell us about the prisoners, Abner cut in. Everything you know. She looked at Abner, then at Samuel. He's helping me, Samuel said. Tell him everything. Helping you what? We don't have time now, mother. Tell him what he asks. Samuel worried they'd be caught talking and she'd have to go in. Please. The prisoners are barely fed. Your father can hardly stand or walk. Guards, Abner said. How many guards? There are guards inside with the prisoners. At the door, two, but one sleeps almost all the time. The other is by the main door. The back door is nailed and boarded shut. There's only one way out. If there's a fire, can you get a private message to your husband? Today or early tonight, she nodded. When I bring the food, the guard goes through it and takes anything good. It's such a small amount. You'd think he'd just let it be. But I will find a way to hide a message. Tell him to be at the front door at midnight, at the middle of the night, if he has, hasn't to watch. Tell him to be there hiding close to the guard, alone. Just him, understand? Yes. Can you slip out at midnight? Abner was abrupt, abrupt terse. Right here at midnight. I will. There are a lot of drunken soldiers on the street at night, but yes. All right. Do that. Tell your husband to get by the door at midnight alone, and you be out here at midnight or just a few minutes after. She nodded, looking from Abner to Samuel. We'll come for you then if everything works out right. Now say your goodbyes and get back in the house before we get discovered. Samuel, she said, turning toward him. You're sure you're all right? Everything will be right after tonight, mother. Please, please be careful. I thought you were dead and I just got you back. I can't lose you again. Go inside, he whispered. He almost smiled, telling him to be careful now after all that had happened. That horse was well and truly gone from the barn. We'll be back later. They looked at each other. She smiled, her lips trembling, staring at him as if to memorize his face. Then at last, she picked up the slop bucket and went back into the house. Prisoners of the British. During the war, at least 16 British Hulk ships had been damaged and abandoned, lay in the waters off the shore of New York City as floating prisoner prisons. Over 10,000 prisoners died of intentional neglect, starvation, and untreated disease. Their bodies were tossed overboard into the harbor as buried in shallow graves at the shoreline by fellow prisoners. Oh, that's chapter 16.